some of those lessons. So I probably won't watch myself anymore. <laughs> uh, so I'd rather do it live, I think, than uh, to watch that again. So thank God for your endurance. But uh, it, it's good to be with you and uh, want to commend you for being here. We're excited about what God is, is beginning here. And it is just the beginning. And uh, we just believe it's going to continue to grow and prosper. Uh, but we're, we're excited. To, you're part of the, the first class. And how many of you know that there will not be another first class? So you're it. You're special people. And so we commend you for being here. And uh, just want you to know that, uh, you know, you need to keep sight of the bigger picture. Because it's not just happening here, but it's happening in 39 other locations around the world. So uh, you're part of something big that God is doing. And indeed, He is doing it. And we're seeing lives transformed and, and just amazed at uh, what God is doing through our CBCs around the world. And so we're excited about that and, and excited to be a part of it. And we're excited that you're a part of it. And... Uh, we just want to see this continue to go and grow, and we believe it will. And uh, I tell you, I don't know uh, a, a price you can put on what you gain from sitting under the Word of God. It's just, uh, uh, it is, it's just uh, super. You know, as I look back in my life, the first few years of my Christian walk, I, I didn't understand how this all worked. And so it's been over a process of time that I've seen the value of sitting under the Word of God and what it will do in your life. And so uh, we're excited about the the plan that God has put together. Uh, Andrew uh, has made this statement many times over, Karis Bible Colleges will be his legacy. Uh, he won't be around forever, but the schools will continue and uh, the Word of God will continue to go forth. And so we just opened our 40th extension school in Australia. Uh, this past month in February, and so that's kind of a, a kind of a, a a marker. Forty schools now, and uh, when we started back in 1994, of course, it was the one school in Colorado Springs, and then my wife and I were privileged to move to England in, in 1997 and start the first extension school, which is continuing now, located in Walsall, and now here we've got uh, four schools in the UK here in East London or London East and uh, then Walsall and then up in uh, Dewsbury in Yorkshire and over in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And so God just continues to bless and once again I want you to always remember you're part of more than what's happening just in this classroom. It is a, you know, we've, we've uh, kind of come up with a theme, one school, many locations. And so you're, you're a part of, of the of the bigger picture. So don't ever forget that. It's important. So I'm glad to be with you this morning, and uh, we're going to spend some time covering some things that uh, should be basic. But you know, as I've uh, been involved in the school these number of years, and of course prior to that, I, I pastored churches for 21 years. And so I've been doing this a while, and I'm always amazed at at how God always brings us back to some of the foundational truths uh, that were valuable in our in our growth process and continue to be valuable today. And so uh, this morning, I want to uh, call your attention to a couple of verses from Romans chapter 12. And uh, we were over in Guilford last night, and I kind of shared my testimony with the group over there. Uh, I like to do that because, you know, the Bible says we should know those who labor among us. And, uh, of course, uh, we've been involved with the school and in the lessons, and so most of you kind of know a little something about me. But uh, I was sharing last night that uh, uh, as I begin to really make a commitment to the Lord and get involved in, in uh, what I felt like God was having us to do and became more active in a local church, uh, the pastor began to call on me to do various things and eventually uh, came around to 
he said, uh, I want you to preach next Sunday morning. I want you to have the morning message. Well, I was not a, uh, I had no training. There wasn't a Karis Bible College back in those days. And so uh, I was I was pretty green and ignorant, but uh, I was excited about the opportunity to get to share. And so as I began to ask the Lord what he would have me to share, he brought me to these two verses in Romans chapter 12. Uh, and uh, what I thought I knew about them then and what I think I know about them now is uh, been uh, miles apart. Uh, I can't imagine... Uh, what I might have said that first time that I used these verses, but I, were, I was drawn to them. And, and they've had an impact in my life over all of these many years. And uh, I was uh, sharing this with, with Andrew one day, and, and he had the same experience. These two verses have played a vital part in his life. And so as we look at them today, uh, you say, well, we know these verses. Well, you probably do, but I mean, you know, you can know more because it's the living word. Uh, you can't exhaust it, and you can't just say, well, I'm, you read it one time and you know it. Uh, God continues to illuminate scriptures as we continue to uh, stay focused on it. So let's go ahead and read these verses, and then we'll go back and, and uh, kind of amplify on them. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and Paul the apostle uh, begins his his statement here to these believers. And he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, and that's how we know we're included. Amen. He's writing to us just as much as he was writing to the Christians in Rome uh, because we are the brethren. And I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now, I'm not going to stay there, but I can't pass that one up. I mean, you know, uh, Paul is imploring these people and he's encouraging them to do something that we'll look at later. But notice he says, I'm doing it by the mercy of God, not through the harshness of God, not through the anger of God, not through the judgmentalism of God, not through any of those things that a lot of the uh, world thinks about how God has people to do things. But he says, I beseech you by the mercy of God. I don't know about the rest of you in this room, but I am so thankful for the mercy of God. Because I know that I'm living a life that I'm not just receiving what I'm faithing for, but a lot of what I have is because of the mercy of God. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the Israelites didn't get a lot of things right, but they got that part right. Thank God for His mercy endureth forever. And uh, it does. Amen. So, Paul says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed uh, to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so as we begin to look at this, we begin to uh, analyze what what Paul is trying to communicate here with the help of the Holy Spirit, and we realize that uh, God is is wanting us to have a life full of, of of victory, a life of blessing, a life of success. Uh, everything in Scripture points to the fact that what Jesus provided at Calvary was sufficient to take care of anything that we would face in life. And he, he provided for us everything that pertains, according to Scripture, that pertains to life and godliness has already been made available to us. But we realize that so much uh, uh, of the body of Christ has not uh, come to a, a revelation of what all is rightfully theirs. We, we don't know truly what our inheritance is. And so Paul begins some really... Uh, uh, basic statements here in these two verses, but but we have to back up just a little while, uh, a little ways, and and begin to see what he's really speaking of in these two verses. And so if we if we think back, we know that what happened to man that caused all the problems in the beginning was there in in uh, the Garden of Eden, in 
the book of Genesis, in the very beginning as God begins to reveal himself to mankind through his word, we, we find a couple of truths that take place. Uh, the first one is that when he talks about creating Adam, it says that he formed Adam out of the dust of the earth and breathed into Adam the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. And so in the very act of creation, we realize that, that God created man as a triune being, which then if we connect that with the fact that we're made in his image and his likeness, we realize that God is a triune God, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. Now, a lot of people have tried to explain the Trinity. I won't. It's one of those wonderful spiritual mysteries that, that he is... He is one God manifested in three ways, but in like manner, we are one person, but we consist of three beings or three parts. And that is, of course, spirit, soul, and body. And, and you've probably had some of that teaching here. I know this is the, the, what Andrew classifies as, as the key that began to unlock a lot of this, the truths of the Word of God was to realize that we are spirit, soul, and body, and and in fact, the real, the real us is a spirit because God is a spirit and we're made in his image. So the real us, we're spirit beings. And that's the eternal part of us that's, that's uh, never going to cease to be. Our spirit is eternal. And, and every man that's ever come into existence, uh, that's true of them. The only thing is, we get to determine where that spirit man spends eternity. Uh, but everyone that, that has come into the world, they're going to uh, last forever because spirits are eternal beings. So, but what happened here in the beginning is that when God created man, his plan for man was that man be a God vessel, a God carrier. Uh, he, he, his plan was to inhabit mankind. That, and, and we see that as he breathed into Adam, he breathed himself into Adam. And, and so in the beginning, man was a God carrier or a vessel that contained God. We know that when, when Adam sinned, uh, you know, the, the Lord spoke to Adam and Eve and said, you know, of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but of this one tree you shall not eat, and in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. Uh, you know, and if you look that up in the Hebrew, it really makes a, makes a lot more sense because, because it says, in dying thou shalt die. So he's talking about a process begins, uh, something instant happens, but then a process begins. And of course, we know that what happened was because of sin, God's spirit was separated from man's spirit. So God did not forsake man, did not leave man alone as some teach. It's just that he could no longer live in man because man had now had taken on a sinful nature. And of course, God is a holy God and the two will not mix. And so he didn't leave Adam and Eve alone. And of course, you can follow right on through. He never forsook man. It's just the fact that he couldn't live in man. Now, see, the original plan was Everything produces after its own kind. So if Adam and Eve had stayed true to God, everybody that would have been born after would have been born with the Spirit of God in them, but we didn't happen. So God started this plan of redemption even then. And, and, and the, in the Old Testament, he did it through, uh, because these people were not spiritually alive. He had to communicate to them through their soul and their body. And that's the reason we have all the physical things that happened in the Old Testament. And so one of those things was sacrifices. And without the shedding of blood, according to Scripture, there was no remission of sins. And so uh, people began to understand that. But all the way through, uh, God's plan was once again to be able to inhabit man because that was his original plan, and he never changed that plan. And so the, through the process of time and, and Jesus coming as a man and becoming the... Uh, supreme sacrifice and and the substitute for you and I. He made it possible for us to come into a relationship with God that once again we could be God inhabited. But now here's here's what Paul is addressing in these verses, a and we can all 
do this by a process of elimination. When we are born again, and of course, you know, the plan of salvation is, is that you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says you'll be saved. Or using the term that Jesus used with Nicodemus, you must be born again. And, and Nicodemus had this kind of confusion in his mind because when, when, God, when Jesus said you must be born again, he immediately thought about a physical birth. And he said, how can a man when he's old enter a second time into his mother's womb? And then Jesus said, no, I'm talking about that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, but you must be born again. And so when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, there was a birth that took place on the inside of us. But how many of you know it was not our physical birth, because that's what confused Nicodemus. And how many of you know your brain didn't get born again. So what part of us had that experience of becoming a new creation? Our spirit man. Okay, are you with me? So now, after we're born again, that real us on the inside of us is a brand new creation. And this is something that the body of Christ needs to get a hold of. It wasn't just one painted up and fixed up. It became a brand new creation. And it was once again restored or, or made like it was in the original state. And once again, as Adam was in the very beginning, we became a God container. Uh, God's spirit joined with our spirit on the inside. And so uh, we realize that as we go through that, uh, when you were born again, if you were six foot tall and good looking, after you were born again, you were still six foot tall and good looking. And just the opposite if you weren't. Or if you were, you know, uh, blessed, physically endowed, you know, like some of us are, when you got born again, you were after you were born again. It's amazing that, you know, when you got born again, you didn't lose 25 pounds. That would have been nice, but it didn't happen. So we realize that by going through the process that nothing changed physically when we were born again. Uh, we didn't change age, we didn't change appearance, we were still the same physical being that we were when we were born again. Our spirit was made new. And then we realized after we were born again, most of you probably, it didn't take long to figure out, you still had the same thoughts. Uh, and some of them weren't, weren't uh, what you would think would be pleasing to God. So now Paul is addressing this very issue in these two verses. He basically is now saying that I believe that you as believers understand that your spirit man was changed, that your spirit man was made brand new. Your spirit man is the one that, that I wrote about in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and, and the new is of God. So Paul is, is knowing or he's believing that the Christians understand that their spirit was made new when they were born again. But now he's saying, but there's two other parts of you that haven't been dealt with yet. And so God did to the part that you could do nothing about and made you a new creature in Christ. That's your spirit man, made in the image and likeness of God. But now he says, we've got to deal with the other two parts of you because you are... You are uh, one unit. And so he starts off in verse 1 talking about your body. Now remember, we, we said that God had communicated with people all the way through and they had in their mind sacrifices. And, and, and what was a sacrifice? What was it symbolic of? Well, what happened when they brought a sacrifice and laid it on the altar? It was totally consumed. In other words, it was totally committed uh, to God. It was offered to God as a sacrifice and it was totally committed. There wasn't any part left. So now he's saying about our body, he says, now that's what needs to happen to your body. It needs to be fully committed to the Lord. But I don't want a dead body. So now he says, present your body as a living sacrifice. So the, the, the body that God is asking us to commit totally to him he wants it to be a living body. So he calls it a living sacrifice, but the principle is the same. He wants us to be totally 
in, in our body given to the Lord and recognizing that this body now belongs to God. We've been bought with a price, amen? It says you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to God. So he's saying just give yourself this and, and notice he said, this is not a fanatical thing to do. This is the reasonable thing to do. Isn't it amazing how the body of Christ has, has kind of mentally compartmentalized all these things and saying, well, you know, I can, I can give part of myself to it. No, he's talking about it needs to be totally given, and it's reasonable. It's not unreasonable. So he says, present your body a, a living sacrifice, totally acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. So he's wanting us to recognize uh, that we need to take care of this physical body because it's not yours to, to do with as you please. Now, uh, I'm not going to uh, stand up here and make all my public confessions, but I probably haven't taken care of my physical body uh, to the degree that I should. But now I'm going to back up to the former class that you just saw me teach on Proverbs, and there were a couple of uh, statements of wisdom uh, in that Proverbs that talked about giving your body health and giving it long life. Now, isn't it sad that uh, we live in a day and an age, and, and, and I hope you hear this in the, in the spirit that I give it, uh, I've watched some Christian television programs and I've been in some uh, churches that they're just totally given to nutrition. And they have all these nutritionists on and telling you what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. But if you listen to enough of these guys, you're going to be totally confused. Because one telling you if you eat this, it'll kill you, and the other say, but if you don't eat that, you'll die. You know, how many years were we told, don't eat butter, eat margarine? Now all of a sudden, don't eat margarine, eat butter. Well, did you know, Scripture really doesn't address that, but it does tell you how to have length of days and healthy lives. And, and it says, attend to my word. And it says, honor your parents. And on and on, there are a lot of things in Scripture that tells us how to live in health and how to have long lives, and it doesn't have to do with taking pills or not eating this or eating that. Now, should we watch what we do? Yes, I confess. Uh, I don't always do that. That's a, but I've worked many years to get in the shape I'm in. Uh, and I've practiced very diligently to, to get it in that shape. But... I recognize my body belongs to the Lord. It's not mine. So I, I, I've totally given it to the Lord to the best of, of my ability. Okay. So now we see God dealt with our spirit, made it brand new. Now Paul is telling us we've got a responsibility to do something with our bodies and recognize it belongs to the Lord and give it totally and completely to Him. And once again, recognizing that now and remember, he's talking to people that came through the tabernacle and the temple, so they understood where God, under the old covenant, what was his dwelling place. And, of course, we know it was originally in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. That's where God lived. And the purpose, you know, the Jews messed up on that one too. They, they caused it to become a religious place, but God said, build a tabernacle so I'll have a place that I can dwell in the midst of my people. See, from day one, God's wanted to be in the middle of everything that we're doing. His original plan was to be in us. Sin messed that up. Jesus came and made it possible that once again, God can move back in. And now your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, or now this is where God lives. Now, I, I see in here that all of you are, are not having any problem with that statement. But did you know most of the church world still didn't have a revelation of that truth? And they're not sure where God lives. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, go to some churches and you'll find out they're, they're going through all kinds of, of things to get God to come. Y'all ever been there? 
they're imploring on God to come and, and visit them. Well, God didn't say, I'm going to come to visit. <laughs> he said, under the new covenant, I'm going to come and abide with you forever. And, and so what I'm saying is, we may take it for granted that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and this is where God lives, but a lot of the church world hadn't got that yet. And they're still wondering where he is. And I'm always amused at these churches where they spend about the first half hour imploring God to come. But they never tell you when he gets there. Have you ever noticed? They come Holy Spirit. Well, okay, did he come or did he not come? No one, no one tells us. But you and I understand that when we show up, that's when God shows up. And where we go, that's where God goes. This is, this is God's plan. We, we are his representatives on earth today. So, here we, here we have Paul dealing with the, the physical part of us. But then look at verse 2, and this is where he really, he really begins to zero in on what's really going to make a difference in our life. And he says here in, in verse number 2, Be ye not conformed to this world, but be you transformed or totally changed by the renewing of your mind. And, and this is what we're, we're going to embark on today and, and realize that, that uh, what Paul is addressing is that from the time that we're born until the time we have that life-changing encounter with Jesus, we're being conformed to the world. And every one of us Makes no difference who you are or where you came from. From the time you were brought into this world, information began to be put into your head. Or if we, if we're using the, the terminology that, that Paul is, is using here, our soul realm, our mind, our will, our emotions. It's being programmed by, usually it starts off with our parents. And then as we get into the educational system and then as we get out into the world proper, these things are being fed in here and this is how we begin to form our thought pattern, our opinions, our, our likes and our dislikes. I mean, you know, all of us are taught those things. They don't come naturally. And, and so Paul begins to address this saying, you know, basically up until the point you meet Jesus, the only thing that has fashioned you and, and, and made you the way you are is what's been received from the world system. And listen, before we go any further, that doesn't mean it's all evil or all sinful. It just means it doesn't necessarily line up with God's way of thinking and God's opinion. And so, uh, you know, I... I I go to a little extreme on this just to make a point. But folks, when you came in the world, you didn't know anything. There wasn't anything in your head. And so all of it was put in there from some source. And that's the reason we have uh, families who think alike and, 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 and develop their appetite the same way. Do you realize that that's how you formed your likes and your dislikes. If you grew up in a, in a home uh, that your parents didn't like a certain food item, I guarantee you, you grew up thinking you didn't like it either. And until, unless you became brazen enough to try it one time, you'd probably go through your entire life saying, I don't like that, having never tasted it. Because your parents didn't like it. You know what I'm talking about? Now, I grew up in a home where if you made a sandwich, you'd take two slices of bread and you'd put Miracle Whip on that bread and then you'd put your lunch meat, cheese, or whatever else you put on there and that was your sandwich. So that's, that's the way you make sandwiches. And that's the correct way. Uh, and then I met my wife, and we started dating, and one day I was at her house, and she fixed me a sandwich. And I took a bite, and I thought, what in the world? Mayonnaise. Now, everybody ought to know, you don't put mayonnaise, you put Miracle Whip. 
Now, just take a little poll here. Of course, I know over here, y'all probably put butter. Right? You don't use Miracle Whip or mayonnaise. You use butter. Right? And now what you put on your sandwiches? I've had a few sandwiches over here. I've even had a few cucumber sandwiches now. <laughs> now, where in the world did that idea come from? <laughs> Cucumbers go on salads. They don't go on sandwiches. <laughs> the point I'm making is, see, we form those opinions by what was put into our minds. It wasn't because we just never thought. And you know what? I like mayonnaise on sandwiches now. But at first it was totally wrong. And then when we lived here in England for a couple of years and we started getting sandwiches that had butter on them and there was a lot of cucumbers, you know, I, it's not bad. But the point I'm making is, see, these, this information was fed into here. And, and so then we formed that opinion about everything. Uh, we like this political party or we don't like that political party or we like this or we don't like that. We like this sport, we don't like that sport. And all of those things were, was programmed in. We didn't come into the world with that. We, we had that information plugged in. Now, let me, let me define some of these words. Conformed. And the word conform means to fashion or to shape one thing like another. So Paul is, is saying in this verse of Scripture, don't let the world fashion or shape you like something else. But now we all have to admit that's the way we were until we met Jesus. That was the only influence. That's the only thing that was shaping us was what we were hearing. And, and once again, uh, it happened to our parents. Their parents did the same thing to them. This is why you see down through the ages that families just, they went on until there was somebody that began to think another way. Then the word transformed. So he says, don't let the world shape you or fashion you, but be transformed. And that word is uh they tell me the Greek word is metamorpho, but it means to change into another form. And of course, the one that's usually used, the illustration, and I can't improve on it, is a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. That's, that's the transformation that Paul is addressing here. And how many of you know the, the, the caterpillar didn't become another creature, it just took on another form. Right? In other words, that caterpillar in that cocoon emerged as a butterfly, but there wasn't another creature that got inside there. It's just that the caterpillar changed into a butterfly, but it was still the same creature. Now, Paul is, is, is using that terminology, and he's saying, don't let the world fashion you or shape you, but be totally changed into another form. And he, here's the process, he says, that it's going to take to bring about that transformation is going to be the renewing of your mind. In other words, he realizes that the, the first part of how we became how we are was the world putting thoughts into this place. But he says, we've been changed on the inside. Now we need to do something about this so that they can be in agreement. And he tells us, you know, that we can't continue even as believers to operate through what had been programmed into here because the carnal mind or the worldly mind or the natural mind is enmity against God and can't please God. That's the reason he says it needs to be changed. It needs to be refashioned. It needs to be renewed. Now, the word renewing means to restore, to renovate, or to make new. And the uh, Greek word is, and don't hold me to pronunciation, but anakonosis is the way I would pronounce it. And it comes from two Greek words, ana, which means back or again, 
and kenos, which means new, or literally to make back new or to make new again. To make new again. Now, I want to show you the difference here in what happened to your spirit and what needs to happen to your mind. And I use a real earthly illustration. Uh, if you go to a furniture manufacturer and you see his product, that's a new creation. In other words, if he's making a coffee table after it's made and completed, it's a brand new creation. That's what happened to your spirit. But now if you go to a furniture restorer, he could take that coffee table that had been over years used or misused or something happened to it and, and took it into his shop and began this restoration process and redo it and set it out here. It looks new again, but it it's not the original creation. It's just been made new again. So you see, our spirit is that new creation, what the furniture guy just created. Our mind is already there. It just needs to be made new again. And the process he is saying is that it has to be made new again, and here's what's going to make it new again. Because now our spirit is in total agreement with God because it's made in the image and likeness of God. It's brand new. doesn't have a past, doesn't have any history. It's a brand new creation. And now he's saying, and, and you totally committed your body to the Lord. Now, if you'll get this thing operating right, if you can get this to come in agreement with God, then you're going to begin to enjoy the perfect, acceptable, and holy will of God. You're going to walk it out. But he's saying, until that part is done, you're not going to be walking out the perfect will of God because those worldly influences are going to continue to get in the way. How many of you have had that experience? And so we're beginning this process and say, I want to commend you Bible college students because you're, you're ahead of the game because the renewing process takes place as you replace worldly thoughts with godly thoughts. And the godly thoughts are contained right in here. If you want to know God's thoughts on any subject, it's right in this book. God's thoughts expressed in words. That's what the Bible is. And so the process begins of getting out the thoughts that have been programmed in there since day one and replacing them with God's thoughts. Now here's what God says about his thoughts. Over in Isaiah 55, I believe it's verse 11, says, you know, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And then he makes a comparison. He says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. What he's telling us, he thinks on a higher plane than we think. He thinks differently to us, but his thoughts are not past finding out. That's why he gave us this book. That's the reason he says over in Corinthians, and we'll look at that here in, in just a little. Well, let's just go ahead and turn over there now. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I believe it is. And let's uh, jump in here in 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, man, it's the whole thing is, is beginning with verse 6. But for the sake of time, let's jump down to uh, verse number 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So here's what he's telling us. He's saying that 
with this mind that we were born with and this mind that's been conformed to the world by the thoughts that have been placed in here, we're not going to be able to understand the things of God. We're not going to be able to perceive the things of God because God is a spirit. We're a spirit. But we've got to learn to communicate with God, not with carnal mind, but with a spiritual mind. Okay, now listen real carefully because this is, this is where the rub comes in. You realize that so much of quote-unquote Christianity today, the reason there's so many divisions is because of most people are approaching the Bible through their intellect. In other words, a lot of the theologians, and, and it doesn't take you long to figure it out if you'll get some of their theological works, you'll see that when they go through the Scriptures, they are just mentally, intellectually analyzing what the Word says. But Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. He says over in Romans chapter 8, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So what does it mean to be spiritually minded? It means to be word minded because Jesus said the words I speak to you, they're spirit and they're life. So if we're going to have life and peace, we've got to start thinking spiritual thoughts and approaching God and understanding God spiritually not intellectually. And that's the reason we've got to change the way we think. We need to start thinking spiritually rather than thinking carnally or naturally or worldly or fleshly. And so now, see, this takes on a whole new deal. Uh, we just realized that, that families act and think and talk alike because of what's been put in there since we were babies. But we've changed families. And see, now we've got to learn what our new father <laughs> and, and our new family, how they think and how they act and their opinions on things rather than the family that we were born into in the flesh. And I tell you, the Scriptures is so full of, of what the mind is about. Let me just read a few. What time is this class over, by the way? <laughs> no it's not <laughs> repent another seven minutes okay let me let me just read these scriptures and we'll be ready for the next class uh, real quickly let's, let's look at this Ephesians chapter 2 beginning with verse 1 and the scripture says and you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Of course, this is talking about being made spiritually alive again because we weren't dead physically. We weren't dead soulishly. We were dead spiritually. Now he's made us alive spiritually. Uh, and But now look at verse 2. We're in, in times past. In other words, before you were born again, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children under disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or conduct in times past in the lust of our flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So he's telling us in this before we were born again the thing that controlled us was our fleshly desires and our carnal mindly desires but he says that's changed or should be changed. Then Ephesians 4, just continue along that line of thought. Verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity, the vainness, the emptiness of their mind. <coughs> and then it goes on <coughs> and talks about how they we were alienated. Then jump down uh, to verse uh, 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verse 
Colossians chapter 1, beginning here in verse number 18. And he, meaning Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works that now hath he reconciled. So he talks about enemies in your mind. You know, you can go to church, you see counselor after counselor, but until you renew your mind by the word of God, you're not going to have permanent help. You can, everybody wants a quick fix, you know, lay hands on me, cast a demon out of me, do something. Now, these things can be temporarily, they can help temporarily, but the permanent, lasting help requires effort, and it comes by the renewing of the mind. And uh, let's go ahead and stop there, and we'll pick up right there when we come back for the next session. Uh, I don't want to get into the next thought because we'd have to cut it off in the middle. So let's just stop right there. And what time do we come back from the break? Come back at 20 till. And we'll pick up right there where we left off. Amen.